Good morning and welcome to Nature Watch. Nature Watch is sponsored by Waddell's Nursery, Floral Garden, and Bird Center at the corner of 12th Street and Millam Road. And now, your host of Nature Watch, Gary Miller. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Jim. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Hey there. So, a little crispy out there this morning, a though li- not too bad. Very comfortable. Oh, yes, it is. Um, however, you would figure with the cooler weather that uh, my my raging summer allergies would go away. Uh-uh. It's yeah, so we'll worse. Talk, we'll talk a little bit about that here a little later on. Yeah, this is this is the worst time of the year for me, and everyone's like, "Well, you know, everything's you know, fall's coming in, and everything's going to be you know, dying off and all that." No, it's it rages until the first frost for me. So, so we still have pollens that are out in the air, and then we start uh, hopefully getting some fall rains. Sometimes we can start getting some of those molds from the the moisture. So. I don't see a lot of allergies yet. I'm the poster boy of that right here. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> so, how you doing? Good, doing great. Yeah. Uh, love this. Uh, you know, last Saturday of summer officially. Uh, uh, we okay. have less than a week. Uh, next Saturday morning, two fifty a.m. Where we officially become fall or autumn, and uh, we'll see how the weather does. I see the weather next week looks like it's going to be more summer like. And I'm first... not <laughs> not complaining at all. <laughs> don't have to shovel anything yet. Don't start. <laughs> you, you'll get Jim McKinney in here. Yeah, I like anything that falls from the sky that does not involve getting out the Toro. So, you know. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, well, well, I guess we'll get our trivia question started so we have a chance for uh, callers to call in. Okay. And because uh, it may take him a little bit of time. So uh, we uh, always think of monarch butterflies migrating. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously an insect. They migrate quite a long distance. The monarch uh, populations that are uh, on the eastern U.S. actually migrate down to areas in Mexico for winter. The monarchs that are on the west coast actually go to Southern California. Some of them may go down to Mexico, but most of them go to Southern California. Oh. So besides monarch butterflies, my trivia question is, name one other insect common to southwest Michigan that migrates to the southern U.S., Mexico, or Central America. And you have uh, quite a few chances here. I have a list. Uh, there's actually uh, at least 71 insect species that migrate. So you have a 1 in 70 chance because a monarch will not be an accepted answer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So he gave you one. So there's 70 options. Yes. There yeah. you go. So if first caller gets the correct answer, we'll win a $20 gift card from Modell's Nursery. And that number is 269-382-4280-877-382. Four two eight zero. Name one insect other than the monarch, which will migrate from Southwest Michigan south to Mexico, California, West Coast, etc. Sometimes along the the seashore down in the southern U.S. around the Gulf of Mexico. So, all right, you have seventy options to choose from. <laughs> Everybody's really trying to Google everything. I'm going to have fun trying to find something. I can tell you. Uh, there, you, there you go. So while, while they're while they're searching and trying to come up with an answer, we'll uh, talk about some other things we're seeing this fall. Okay. Um, goldenrod, and uh, we see a lot of goldenrod. Goldenrods are a, a prolific group of plants in the sunflower family that actually help provide a last display of flowers before the onset of winter. Goldenrod flowers are almost exclusively yellow, with a few species such as silverrod, um, which is the solidago bicolor, having white fl- flowers. Their peak bloom time coincides with fall allergy season. So these plants are often falsely accused of causing allergies. <laughs> the real culprit, as Jim is going to attest, yeah. is ragweed. Uh, ragweed has wind-pollinated flowers, meaning they must release huge amounts of pollen into the air in hopes of reaching and pollinating another ragweed plant. That's the pollen that gets up people's noses and really stuffs them up this time of year. Goldenrods are insect pollinated and use their showy yellow flowers to attract bees and other pollinators. Because they rely on those helpful insects to transport their pollen, they do not need to release as much wind pollinated plant as wind pollinated plants like ragweed. And uh, interesting fact, uh, ragweed or uh, goldenrod pollen is actually sticky. So it's not going to be something that's going to bother your allergies unless you hold that goldenrod bouquet up to your nose and inhale and then that's going to stick to your nose a little bit but still most likely not going to cause allergies oh okay so stop blaming golden rods for your allergies they're innocent <laughs> uh, interesting and look at golden rods if you have a chance to out walking around uh 
There's quite a few different variations on those plants. There are over 20 species in Michigan. And due to the large number of the species and their similarity in appearance, they can be tricky to tell apart. While working on identifying these goldenrods, some of the most helpful information is the habitat that the plants are growing in. Some plants prefer high quality wetlands, whereas others are quite weedy and will thrive along disturbed roadsides. A few species are easily distinguished by appearance alone. For example, the blue stem goldenrod, rough goldenrod, or stiff goldenrod. But others are trickier, which are some of the very common ones. Giant goldenrod, tall goldenrod, Canada goldenrod. So goldenrods are typically classified, and one of the ways to classify them in, in six different groups, by the way their flowers grow. Uh, they vary from uh, flower heads that are flat or flattish topped. Mm -hmm. If you remember, you're looking at goldenrods, you can see that. Um, woodland goldenrods, so typically they have very few flowers in those woodland goldenrods. And they're sort of up and down the stem, uh, just a few flowers in a grouping. Uh, flower heads that are arranged on one-sided arched branches. So you'll sometimes see those clusters of uh, those yellow flowers. Hmm. Okay. Uh, flower heads that are um, rod or plume-shaped. So they really have that sort of central stem, and then they've got little branching. Very uh, looks like a almost like a Christmas tree with yellow flowers. Ah. Uh, and then the uh, grass-leaved goldenrods. So those usually have leaves that are very narrow, all similar size. And so looking at those, that's a way to identify them. Uh, they range from growing in those really wet areas like bogs, but they also can grow in fens, which are an alkaline wetland. And, uh, and some of them grow in very dry upland uh, areas. Okay. The other confusing part is they sometimes hybridize. So you see little variations in them. And so usually you look at habitat first, what kind of soil they're growing in, uh, and then also looking at heights. They vary in height from some very short ones that are only a foot or 15 inches tall uh, up to four, four plus feet sometimes. Okay. So it can be quite a variation. There you go. Uh, Our a, trivia question this morning, we're looking for uh, one insect out of 70 yes. to choose from that will migrate from southwest Michigan south to Mexico or west to the uh, west coast. 269-382-4280, first correct answer We'll get a $20 gift card from Waddell's. And John's on the line. You want to take a shot at this, sir? I do. All right. <laughs> Good morning, John. Good morning. How are you? Good. What what so what my, insect are you looking at here? My guess is the painted lady moth. Oh, yeah. So actually, the painted lady is a butterfly. But I will accept that answer. Oh, okay. there, is a, <laughs> there, is, there is a okay. painted uh, moth, too. But the painted lady uh, uh, butterfly is actually uh, one of the longer distance uh, migrating insects. So that right. is a correct answer. There you go. Thank you. Hey, congratulations, John. You have a $20 gift card coming to you from Waddell's Nursery Floral Garden and Bird Center. 12th Street and Millam Road is where you can find them. And what we're going to do is put you on hold, all right? Um, Mike sure. will pick up the phone and get the information from you, and we will mail out that gift card to you, okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey, hang on the line. And, of course, we'll take our uh, first break right here. Um, 269-382-4280 Nature Questions for Gary Miller right here on Nature Watch as we continue next on WKZO Want to add some color to your life? Flowering bulbs from Waddell's are actually some of the most colorful, fail-proof blooms available. And now is the time to plant bulbs to ensure you have a more colorful spring. All you need to do is dig, drop, and you're done. At Waddell's, you'll enjoy browsing the biggest selection around of spring flowering bulbs. More wonderful spring fragrance get hyacinths. A must to start your spring are tulips. Get some of the largest blooming tulips around Waddell's Pride Tulips that come in beautiful pink, yellow, white, or red. Some of the other beauties at Waddell's include large yellow flowering King Alfred daffodils, early blooming snowdrops, and for a treat this fall, try fall blooming crocus. More bulbs available include double flowering tulips, fritillaria, and many colors of narcissus. Come browse more than 100 varieties of spring flowering bulbs at Waddell's. Then just dig, drop, and you're done. Next spring will bring to life how beautiful flowering bulbs really are from Waddell's Nursery Florist and Garden Center. 54 in Kalamazoo at 590, 106.9 FM WKZO as we continue with Nature Watch and Gary Miller. And we're back. There you go. So a little bit, uh, we'll talk about insects in a little bit here with these migrating insects. Well, um, 
continue talking a little bit about goldenrod. The uh, goldenrod, so florists sometimes sell goldenrod flowers and fur bouquets and that under the their genus name Saladago, which is much more posh sounding. <laughs> this is probably because many people associate goldenrods with weediness and hay fever, which is not the correct, as we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. um, although many people overlook goldenrods as weeds, pollinators and other fauna rely on those plants, um, especially for a late season fo uh, food source. Uh, many insects use the stems or leaves as places to lay their eggs, forming round stem galls or odd puffy leaf galls. Birds can easily spot galls and peck into them for a tasty snack of larva or just to eat the goldenrod seeds. So overall, goldenrods are a great contributor to the habitat and actually fun to look at this time of year. With the uh, migrating insects, uh, sort of an interesting uh, tidbit, the American Painted Lady is, uh, uh, migrates uh, about four or 5,000 miles, uh, which is quite a distance. The, uh, its counterpart in Europe migrates over 9,000 miles. Now, how long does it take for them to migrate so that distance? They can, they can migrate. Uh, mo most insects, uh, depends on the particular insect, um, they can, they can actually migrate sometimes up to 400 miles in a day. Really? Uh, which is a long distance. They so must catch the jet stream in the right they spot. They can. <laughs> they can. The, uh, um, a lot of times, the, uh, a lot of the insects that migrate, the butterflies, moths, uh, some beetles, um, etc. typically don't migrate in large groups like the monarch do. So monarch typically forms some groups and migrate. But a lot of times a lot of these other insects sometimes are sole migrators. They, uh, uh, interesting, like we said before, North America has at least 71 migratory insect species, including insects from five different orders, butterflies and moths, dragonflies, beetles, grasshoppers and true bugs such as the large milkweed bug so another milkweed feeder uh, butterflies comprise the largest group at 27 species followed by 20 species of moths and 15 different dragonflies so a lot of those dragonflies uh, green darner is a very common one those typically mi <clears throat> migrate down to near the gulf of mexico um, there have been instances when they are migrating and they migrate in groups. Sometimes they show up on radar, uh, but sometimes they have those large groups. They've had groups uh, that have actually rested along Lake Michigan shore near Chicago that they've had over a million insects in the group. So a huge group of dragonflies flying south. Uh, interesting, too, uh, we always think of butterflies. There's lots of butterflies and many moths. North America has over 12,000 species of moths. Wow. Only 825 of butterfly. And they keep finding more because there's so many little variations in those moths. Michigan has over 2,000 moths. And at last count, we know of 159 butterflies here in Michigan. And sometimes they're very specialized as far as what their larvae feed on. Uh, so, and, and there's a lot of little nuances trying to identify moths. So it can be very, uh, very much a challenge trying to identify them. Ah. So scientists have long scrutinized the seasonal movements of large animals from birds and caribou to salmon and whales. They only have recently begun to take a look, a close look at insect migration. It was only in the last hundred years that researchers recognized that insects could travel long distances. Even then, they assumed insects were being haphazardly blown by the winds, unable to control their direction. Thanks to innovative radar and other technologies, Combined with observations by entomologists and citizen scientists, the fact that many insects migrate long distances is now well accepted. While many small species, indeed, are blown randomly about by wind, studies have shown that many large bo larger-bodied insects can select winds moving in favorable directions and using the winds to their advantage, traveling more than 400 miles per night. Like all migrating animals, insects are driven by shifts in the availability and location of food and other vital resources. Recently, scientists discovered that the magnitude of these insect movements can be staggering. In a 2016 report in Science Magazine, researchers from Great Britain and Israel calculated that 3.5 trillion, that's with a T, insects migrate above the southern United Kingdom annually dwarfing the 2.1 billion migrating 
songbirds and other perching birds that traverse the region each year. Wow. Oh, a big incredible. mass of insects flying uh, flying south. I'm curious, you know, these, these insects, do they have a target area, and how accurate are they at reaching that, you know, target area that they migrate to? So typically they migrate back to a, a same low general vicinity that they, they went overwintered before. But we remember that those are not the same animals that flew north last spring. Mm. And so scientists are still trying to understand <clears throat> how they know how to home in on those, those locations. Um, still trying to study that a recent, you know, hundred years, last hundred years, they really just started looking at that and uh, trying to understand how they know how to home in and go South in that same location. So they're safe for the winter. Some of, some of the insects, even though they, some of them migrate, some of them still overwinter here too. So not all of them migrate. And so we may see some variations with, uh, with the population from that. So it, uh, sometimes they find a safe spot for winter. Yeah. I'll be darned. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of bugs. <laughs> 269 382 If you have a question for Gary regarding, you know, anything nature, but uh, we're talking migration today of insects. You think birds, yeah, they migrate. We all know that. Right. But insects, we just don't really think about. So, so it's sometimes hard to see those migrating insects because like I said, there's a lot of them migrate very solely or in very small groups. And they just sort of gradually start heading south. So you may not uh, really notice. You might see a, a, a few more butterflies or moths that you typically haven't seen before, but uh, not going to see any large groups of them. Oh, I'll be done. Uh, now, if, if you don't want to talk on the radio or, or give us a call, you can text in your question to 80373. I'll read it to Gary, and uh, and he will he will answer it that way. Yes. L- looking forward to some questions coming in. There you go. So it's uh, very interesting with, uh, with all those insects. Uh, I actually was doing a little research for this. I, always learning in this and uh, Mm -hmm. I didn't realize there was many insects that migrate as as they do. So sort of interesting uh, tidbit. Uh, I'm going to talk about another plant that we're seeing a lot of this time of year, pokeweed. Uh, (laughs) I had had a friend of mine who, who was wondering about that. Yes. uh, Those can become quite monstrous. Um, The botanical name of pokeweed, American pokeweed is Phytolacca americana. It is usually six to ten feet tall, but in some instances may reach twenty-one feet. So you've seen those big pokeweed plants. Just imagine that being twenty, twenty-one feet tall. Uh huh. One or more stems arise from a tuber-like taproot that can become quite large over several years. The often pinkish-red, smooth, and partially hollow stem is rigid to flexible, not strong, and up to two inches in diameter. The leaves typically are alternate coming off those stem. Thin, they're green on top, a little lighter green below. The leaves are usually seven and three quarters to 14 and three quarters inches long by four to seven inches wide. So they're very large leafed, tapered at both ends. If you bruise or crush leaves and stems, they have somewhat of an acrid odor. Flowers are born in pinkish racemes, so it's an upright group of flowers, cluster of flowers, uh, linear clusters with each flower on a little short stem. Flowers are usually white to greenish, but maybe pinkish or purplish. So you get quite a variation with those. Um, They have, uh, for those really technical people, five sepals, no petals, and about 10 stamens. They produce a purple-black berry, and that's typically what we see this time of year, that are about a quarter to two-fifths of an inch in diameter with six to 12 seeds per berry. And that sounds like quite a few seeds, and you think of all those clusters of those berries this time of year. Those large plants... uh, in a pokeweed plant, sometimes they'll have over a thousand seeds. Very large plants can have as many as up to forty-eight thousand seeds. So all those little seeds, and the birds eat all those berries, and then they deposit them somewhere. So in the fall, typically the birds will feed on all those ripe berries and then fly directly over your car, leaving multiple purple to crimson birdie bloops on the vehicle. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why. It's those pokeberries. So American pokeweed is a species that uh, typically grows in open or edge habitats, especially where there are birds can roost. It's found at like a forest edge and fence rows under power lines, pastures, old field, forest openings, and other similar areas. It is sometimes a garden or yard weed. That's usually where most people see them. And they grow anywhere. They can grow in very wet conditions, very dry conditions. I do know that uh, if you're going to try to control them, the best way to try to control it is pull them when they're young, 
Um, sometimes if it's been a dry period and they're just a young plant, those roots shrink, shrivel up a little bit and they're very easy to pull, especially after, right after a rain. Okay. They haven't swelled up yet. But those roots mm-hmm. can get massive. I've uh, dug some out and they get really big that are 8 to 10 inches diameter, multi-lobed. Uh, I've dug down two feet and they're still going. Uh, very, wow. very large roots. So it's hard to, to get rid of those. Um, the One thing with um, pokeweed is uh, it's very poisonous. Not a real extreme tox- toxicity, but it is poisonous. All parts of the plant are poisonous. Okay. Are you poisonous to humans or to, to humans. animals to, or humans. to just humans. to humans? Okay. Yeah. So obviously not to the birds because the birds are flying right. everywhere. Yeah. Right. Animals, that, that, um, not, not to birds, but other animals. So like livestock, uh, cattle, horses, sheep, uh, with the plants itself can have some symptoms. The taproot of it's dug up um, actually affects hogs very, very severely. Oh. So something to keep in mind. Uh, the berries are especially poisonous. So when um, you're, you're harvesting any fruit in the fall, make sure you don't get any poke berries when you're harvesting. The only exception with edibility and, and not toxic or not as toxic are the young spring shoots and uh, shoots and leaves. Down south, they, they eat poke salad. That's actually with the young plant of the pokeweed plant. No, thank you. Um, I don't think I want to take the chance. So you have to boil and uh, in at least two changes of water so you get that the mild toxicity out of that new growth. I don't know if I want to take my chance with that. No, I, I I'll stick I'll stick with uh, I'll stick with romaine lettuce for yeah. a salad. I'm good with that. <laughs> the uh, some some of the regional names for for the pokeweed plant are poke just for poke uh, poke salad or poke salad um, typically in the southeast U.S. Sometimes it's called pokeberry. The the fruit is actually an important food for mockingbirds, northern cardinals, and morning doves. And that uh, botanical name Phytolacca means red dye plant. So interesting, uh, Native Americans used the the berries for a very red purplish dye. Uh, they used it for some of their clothing, but they also used to paint their horses sometimes, getting ready for a battle or something. Oh, and so, and as we know, if you brush up against those when you're out mowing the yard, and you got that pokeweed plant that's overhanging, and you're mowing along the lawnmower, and those berries get on you, they stain tremendously. Mm-hmm. Uh, just it's hard to wash out. So uh, try to watch the watch those pokeweed. Uh, they they've, they're pretty numerous. The birds drop seeds. They they plant them about everywhere. Um, so you can remove some, but uh, there's a lot of birds and wildlife that uh, do feed on those berries in the in the fall. And then just deposit them and on your vehicle. Your car. Yes. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, last call for phone calls three eight two four two eight zero for Nature Watch as we are talking pokeweed and migrating insects. That's a combination for you. Yes. <laughs> well, some things you might see in the fall. Right. The I know some of the uh, people that are into. Uh, you know, making yarn and dyeing uh, yarns naturally, and they use the pokeweed berry for the, the dyes in that. Get sort of a pinkish, purplish dye, and and uh, can dye that uh, those fibers. Okay. So it, uh, yeah, those pokeweed plants grow uh, tremendously fast. So we see that little sprout, a little bit of leaf, and coming up in the spring, and you got this very large leaf plant, actually sort of tropical looking. And before we know it, they're all of a sudden six plus feet tall, and Got these sort of very pretty flowers on them, and then all of a sudden they're getting berries, and those berries go from flower to ripe berry stage in about thirty days, maybe as long as forty-five, but they can do it as soon as thirty days. Ah. So right now you're going to see pokeweed plants that not only have flowers on them, but they've got green berries and ripe berries on there, and uh, so they're. Uh, I always try to remove them at least from where I'm mowing because. It's hard to get that stain out of clothing. Yeah, don't wear anything white when you mow. No, no. <laughs> especially this time of year. So, um, just dig. You can dig them up by the roots, but you, you have to go you way need a down. Big shovel, usually. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so typically, when those big tap root, uh, if they get a large plant that's been there several years, that root's going to be a monster. So you want to dig down as much as you can, take as much of it out as you can. Okay. You're going to have to do it probably several times <clears throat> until you weaken those stores of energy in the tap root. Oh, it looks like a huge potato almost, but they're very, very odd shaped potato. <laughs> uh, maybe a, uh, a yam or a sweet potato, more, more like uh, as far as the texture on the surface. Right. Uh, it uh, that definitely uh, is uh, is a challenge. Those birds drop those seeds everywhere. Uh, 
everywhere. I know it. <laughs> uh, so those stems are actually pretty neat. I've seen uh, pokeweed uh, growing in wooded areas where there's been maybe a little bit of tree harvest. Get a little bit of filtered light come in. Birds have dropped the seed and they get just enough dap of light. Got those huge plants. Wouldn't think they'd be growing that big because they're not really full sun. Just a, like I said, they grow just about everywhere. Yeah, and you would think with birds, yeah, when they return in the spring, you notice it on your vehicle, and and it's, it's yeah. worse now, yeah, <laughs> actually. Yeah. Well, there you go. Gary Miller, Nature Watch, thank you, sir, for coming in. Oh, it's been a great morning. There you go. And there's more coming up as uh, your partner in crime, Andy, is coming in after the 9 o'clock news for uh, for uh, Over the Garden Fence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a little bit of a brain freeze. It's a, I, I think it's the, the allergies. allergies. Yeah, exactly. the allergies. Well, Gary, thank you for coming in. Uh, We look forward to it next week, another edition of Nature Watch. And we thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Get outside and enjoy nature. Yeah, get out and enjoy. And thank you for listening to this edition of Nature Watch. Tune in each Saturday morning at 830 for Nature Watch. It's brought to you by Waddell's Nursery, Floral Garden, and Bird Center at the corner of 12th Street and Millam Road. CBS and local news is on the way next. And then over the garden fence right here on 590 and 106.9 FM WKZO.